Okay, so welcome everybody. I'm glad that so many have, of you have come to my talk, which is going to be about uh, Ember.js and Rails and how some design principles, and namely convention over configuration, <coughs> are the same behind these two frameworks. But first of all, let me add uh, my bit to the conference team. So I was looking for some pirate facts as I prepared my talk. And I realized that most of them are, in fact, false. So for example, uh, most pirates didn't bury their treasure. And even if they did, they didn't have a map you know, with a big red X on it marking the, the treasure where they buried it. But one uh, uh, thing I found uh, is true. In fact, they did have parrots from the Caribbean. And, uh, so I think the main reason for the popularity of parrots, or one of the reasons for the popularity of parrots, was that they fetched a very good price back in Europe. So you could say that a good price in, say, a market in London. Uh, you could do this with monkeys too, but as uh, this little quote says, parrots and monkeys are similar in that they crap everywhere, but that, you know, when a monkey doesn't, a parrot it at least doesn't fling it at you. So it's, that's definitely, oops. <laughs> so that's a good point for a parrot. But also, uh, this image is not totally true. I mean, you see a, a, a captain standing on deck with a pirate on, uh, on his shoulder. Well, not really. I mean, can you imagine like the, the pirates climbing the, the mast and, you know, cleaning up the board and everything with a parrot like perched on him like this? But even giving a talk doesn't really work, so... <laughs> and putting Polly down for the rest of this talk. Okay. So before delving into Ember.js, I would like to share you a, a personal story, a love story. And it, the start was rather rough. So I started to... I started to learn Ember.js uh, back in February. Yes, so beginning of February. And it was this very period when um, they went from the 09 version to the 10 like pre 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 release version. And so the docs, most of the docs, still reflected the 09 uh, version, and all the blog posts and other resources were mostly written for the 09. And, uh, the only thing was the, the to do MVC example. How many are you familiar with the to do MVC repository? It's a great way to learn, uh, well, not to learn, but to get a first glimpse uh, on a JavaScript framework. Um, the to-do so to uh, list is implemented in each of them, and you can see how uh, things are set up in your framework of choice. So that was the authentic source uh, that, I, that I found. It was really um, hard to get going. So I did something that I, I like to think that I don't usually do and complain on Twitter. Well, I, I replied to a friend, but it can be considered a complaint, I guess. But the, the interesting thing is that Tom Dale, who is like a core developer, he, he reaches out and asks me what's wrong. And in fact, that's, I think, quite typical of the Ember.js community. So they are, they are very involved and they are very helpful. So as I learned more and more about Ember.js, I really started to, to like it and found that um, the principles behind it really resonate with me. However, the docs were still not that good. So they became better, but they were still not totally there. So I did something I like to think I don't usually do. I complain on Twitter. And another core team member just asked me, so what exactly tripped you up? What, uh, how can we improve this? And so I was involved in an actual uh, project, I mean, uh, that was in production, so not just a toy application. And so I started to feel, I can say, even love uh, towards Ember.js because it was really, it's, I think it's fascinating. Really. So we have a, a happy ending to this love story. So, and this guy in the talk, that's me, I, I'm Balin Terdi and I'm an Ember.js Rails consultant, and you can find me on the web at these addresses. Okay, so let's start uh, to talk about Ember.js. 
So what do we want to achieve with this talk? Um, first and foremost, I would like to, just as Avdi said before, uh, I would really like to spread the love because it's somehow, I, I totally agree that somehow it, it completes uh, the joy that I feel towards Ember.js. So I want, it to, I want you to, to try it and, and feel the same uh, love. I also think, uh, that's, I think that's a solid reason too, that it's a good investment uh, in your career. A definite trend in uh, web applications and web development is moving towards client-side frameworks. And so you have to choose, well, you don't have to, but it's, it's a good thing that uh, you get acquainted with one of those. Another one is that I'm a back-end developer, or I've been a back-end developer most of the time, and I found that front-end development is a totally new field, but it's, it's really a lot of fun. And it's not just fun, there is also like, a, a, I think there is also a boasting factor, like when you do front-end development, you're actually closer to the user, or what the user sees, or how the user interacts with your site, so it's easier to to show off, basically. I mean, that shouldn't be the main reason, but for example, uh, when I explain my wife uh, what I'm working on, I can, before I told her, hey, look, I just, I don't know, I, trip, I, I cut down two seconds on the run of this sorting algorithm, and she was like, wow, that's fantastic. Now I can actually show her something that she sees, she realizes that it's, uh, I don't know, it's a really good widget that uh, makes uh, the site easier to interact with, so it's, it's better in this respect. Let's compare uh, how server-side and client-side frameworks work, because there are definite differences, but just very quickly. So, with the server-side MVC, a request comes in, the router uh, dispatches it to the controller, to the appropriate controller, and then that controller fetches some model data, and then, actually, the, the controller sets some variables so that the view can render the response. Sometimes there are presenters or decorators involved, but this is the basic flow. And then the, the view just renders a big chunk of HTML or JSON or XML and sends it back. The important thing to note is that these objects only live as long as the request lives. So and then they are torn down, they are thrown away. Client-side frameworks, let's first see the components and then how they work together. So these concepts will be different, uh, with the exception of the model, which is kind of the same thing. You define your business logic in these models. The controllers actually are somehow like the view uh, on the, uh, sorry, like the decorators or presenters uh, on the back end. The view is actually totally different, like, on the, like it's a reusable UI component that uh, handles actions. And what is called template here on, in, in the client-side framework is what we call view on the server side. So if you come from, the, from a back-end MVC, it's, it's a definite uh, mind shift. You have to do some unlearning. So how do they work? That's a very rough diagram. But whenever the URL changes or when the URL or when the user enters the URL, the router activates um, one or more routes, actually more routes. And then the route, so it's actually the route, uh, that's a, a separate entity in Ember.js. So it fetches some model data through an adapter, and then it sets up the controller. And the controller serves as a context for rendering the template. So a template can render uh, from the controller. And unlike server-side MVC, objects are long-lived, so they are not uh, destroyed. In fact, for example, in Ember, the same controller, the same controller uh, instance, so object instance, uh, exists for the, for the session, for the whole session, and it can change models. So the model objects change behind this controller, but the controller change, uh, does not change, stay the same. And on the server side, you have to maintain state in your, in your models, in your database. Uh, here uh, you have, we will see, but it's not only in that layer that that happens. 
So let me do some uh, convincing because um, it's not obvious that you need a, a client side framework for your web app. So the first phase uh, of this persuasion process, which I think is easier to do, is that I think we can agree that the classic model, which was uh, which is still in use in some places, but is dying out. Like, users actually don't really like sites where you just click a link and the whole thing reloads. Then you, I don't know, you click a checkbox, you have to wait for the whole thing to, the, the whole page to be rendered again. And also, they need um, better, swifter, um, more intuitive UIs. The classic solution: just use jQuery, you know. And that works until a certain size, but. When that certain size uh, is exceeded, then things start to break down. I mean, you can sprinkle jQuery um, selectors and modify the DOM here and there, but it's not really a maintainable model. Also, if you use a, a framework, then it really gives structure to a code. And by structure, uh, I don't mean file structure, well, that too, but I think what's more important is that it gives you things, it gives you concepts to, to think in, to, to use these concepts to, to imagine how your app will be uh, built up. And of course, when you use a framework, um, there are lots of things which you get for free. And you don't have to re uh, reinvent the wheel each and every time that you start a new app. And also, you have less, less bugs, because someone else uh, had already done the hard thing and we did out the bugs. OK, so let's suppose that I convinced you that you need a client side framework. If you go, to, for example, to this to do MVC repository, you will find two dozen frameworks. So why should you use Ember.js in the first place? I think these are the main selling points of Ember.js. Uh, I could have a little lot more, but <laughs> it wouldn't fit. So let's go, let's go through these and see what they do and how they are awesome. The first thing is two-way data bindings. So when you set up a binding, and you usually don't explicitly create a binding, but you, uh, so Ember does this for you, for example, with, with this thing here. What happens is that whenever one end of this binding changes, the other is automatically updated. So for example, in, uh, in this example that I, I put on the slide, this just creates an input field, a text field. And whenever you change the value of that text field, that property on the controller will change its value. And that's true the other way around, too. So if you uh, set this property on the controller or you modify it, then you will actually see the value of this text box updated in real time. So you don't have to do any uh, DOM fiddling with the DOM. The other big thing is computed properties. So, um, so when you, for example, this is the way you define computed properties. And what happens is uh, this is this property um, method call at the end that, that actually makes this a computed property. Otherwise, it would be just a normal function. And what happens is that Ember automatically keeps this full name uh, valid. So whenever either first name or last name changes, it will run the function again and then cache the value between these two, between updates. And so putting these two together, uh, two-way data bindings and computed properties, you have uh, what is usually called a single source of truth. So I think a very recurring theme in client-side development is that you have one uh, source, yeah, one, yeah, uh, let's say, original data, and you have lots of instances where this data or some data derived from this data is put on screen. Again, uh, staying with the classic uh, to-do list example, you definitely have like the number of incomplete to-do somewhere on the screen. So whenever you add a new to-do, you, you have to make sure to update that instance there. And you can easily forget that. And it's just a simple, so this, this is not really a a huge application, when things start to grow, you will have several instances of, uh, of the same data. So with Ember, um, this is made very easy, because 
what we saw so with the computed properties and data bindings, if, if you set this up once, it will just do the right thing and will keep their, your templates updated. The other big thing about Ember, I think, is that routing is like a core principle. It's, it's not just like an afterthought that, OK, maybe our uh, framework should also handle URLs. And you will see quotes like this, again, from one of the core team members. Uh, Tom Dale even said that if your, if your framework doesn't have, if your web application doesn't have URLs, you're not a web developer. So URLs are essential for, for Ember. Because that's the way you share things, you collaborate on applications, you refer to things. And you will see this uh, in Ember, that the router is really the, the core thing. It's the conductor of the whole orchestra. It's how, it's how your application uh, is the, the central piece of your application flow. And it manages application state. We'll, we'll see exactly how. And there is a clear separation of concerns. So it's not that you have some global objects or some object that you can just add properties to, and then other pieces will, will see that. And so again, we will see that the route, in fact, plays a central role here. So it's the route that sets up the controller, and it's the route that fetches data from the model to display. The model doesn't know anything about which controller uses its data or which route fetches its data. The controller, in turn, doesn't know anything about which templates use their data. It's only the template that displays the appropriate properties. So I think that's really a good thing. It, it gives you constraints, but these are constructive constraints. And so the way routes do this is through hooks. So there is a hook for fetching the model, for setting up the controller. And there are defaults for most of these things. And you only need to override this if you want a different behavior. So for example, here I define a user route, and I just fetch its model from a backend. So I just fetch some JSON data very simply, and then I can use the data that I fetched in my template. So convention over configuration is another design principle in Ember. You have less code to write, but also a quote I heard in a podcast is that you no longer, since you don't have to do it explicitly, there is no, fa no way for you to get it wrong. And Ember was in a fuzzy state between March and end of August, very end of August, but now it's 1.0, so it's a totally stable version. It has already been in production in several big companies, so you don't have to worry about that, about using beta software. OK, so much talking. Let's see some code. So this is the way. That's, some, that's Rails code. So I set up a few routes. And then, as probably most of you know, yeah, how many, uh, who is proficient with Rails or just knows how to use Rails? OK. So when you define a resource route and you go to session new or session create, we, we know that it just dispatches this to the sessions controller uh, action, whichever action was um, called on. So this is how you do it in Rails. And when you have a resources, when you define a, a, a resource, then it will just use the, the controller whenever a URL under that resource is requested. And Ember is very similar. When you define these routes, then there is an index route which is created under the hood, so you don't explicitly define it. And after that, all the routes that you define will just use the same name, but in camel case. So for the token route, you will have to define app.token route in, in camel case. And you have resource routes in Ember too. You have to use these when you want to nest other routes inside it so that it's reflected in the, U, uh, in the URL too. And the only exception here is that the routes inside that block, so inside that resource block, will use the name of the resource as a prefix. So I defined um, 
the user timeline route is, is the easiest to explain. So I defined a timeline route and the name of the actual route when you want to def, uh, modify its behavior will, is going to be user, which is the name of the resource, and then timeline route. Again, whenever we have like a resource definition, Ember automatically generates an index route inside that. So you have these, and then for the controllers, it's pretty straightforward. You use the same name, but instead of the route suffix, you use controller. And the templates, instead of the camel case name, we just use the name of the routes and put a slash between the, the segments. So if you have a resource, that is going to be uh, the first thing. OK. Now let's see an actual working Ember application that I wrote. It's a simple Twitter client, so nothing fancy. Okay. Some mirroring would be cool. But... Okay, so this is cached. These are all, all tweets. And the first thing that I want to show you. Yeah, how do I do that? Oh, thank you very much. Simplifies things. So if you use Chrome, then you have a very, very nifty extension called Ember Inspector. And that's very, very useful when you start out, but even later. I'll show you why. One of the things is that all the, the application, sorry, the, the naming conventions that I ex explained on the slides, you have, you have these under the routes tab. So you can see that which route name generates which routes and controllers, templates, and so on. The other thing is this view tree that if you go here, you can see how your, your templates are laid out. So you see that which, which template is where on your, on your page. And if you use Ember Data, which is a persistence library, I don't have time to talk about it, you, can, you could even observe your data here. So you can see that the client side route here is slash user simply. So let's see, since I emphasized the importance of URLs, uh, let's, let me explain you how an Ember app is built up using this URL scheme. So the first thing that we have to look at is the route definitions. So you already saw that on the slides. But so when slash user is entered, it's in fact is the this user route, or more precisely, is the user index route uh, that is going to be activated by the Ember router. And so here, let's see which templates get rendered. What Ember does is that it goes from top, I mean, regarding the URL, is that it goes from top and down. So the first um, thing is that an application template is always going to be active. And that's like a layout in Rails. So this thing here is always going to be rendered. And in Rails, you'd usually find, with a yield block, you'd usually find this is the place for other templates to render their content. Uh, in Ember, you use outlet. So OK, we have the slash route. Then the next thing is, is user. So when you define a resource route like this, it's going to render this user template. So this is the next thing. If you take a look here, then we saw, as in fact, this hole is the user, but the user template renders this, uh, this box to compose a new tweet and this mini profile. And this level, so this template, also defines an outlet for other templates to render their content into. 
And then, actually, it's going to be the user slash index. The last, so the last level is going to be this, which only renders the tweets them, themselves by a partial, which is exactly the same as in Rails, again, the partial thing. So this is the, oops. So this is the final template that is going to be rendered. And again, coming back here, you see a user index on the right. So let's see how templates use their controllers as context for the actual rendering to get properties and everything. So again, you see that the user route, let's ignore these actions. The important thing is the model here. It fetches the model. If I make it, can you still see this from the back? Okay. So you can see that the user route defines, in fact, fetches user data from the backend, and that backend in turn just fetches the user data from Twitter. So here in this user template, Ah, uh, yeah, so Ember uses handlebars as its templating language, which is similar to Mustache. And what you put in double, in Mustaches, in double curly braces, is going to be evaluated. So everything that we found, that we find here, the statuses count, friends count, followers count, comes from the actual, so these are properties defined on the, on the user controller. And at the very last level, the actual tweets, you can see an additional thing, which is item controller. And what happens going back here is that each tweet is going to be wrapped in a tweet controller. So let's go back and see what this tweet controller defines. So in fact, I told you that the dynamic things, so the things in curly braces, have to be defined on the controller. And we see that, for example, this is the case with parsed text. We have parsed text here defined on the controller, retweeted line defined on the controller again, bigger profile image. But if you look closely, for example, we have this author name. And however hard we look, we will not find the author name defined on this controller. So what happens? How does this work? There is another. Uh, convenience uh, with Ember controllers is that when a controller is backed by a single model, it's an object controller. And so when a property is looked up on the controller and it doesn't find it, it just proxies this on to the model behind it. So it's like a delegation. So this author name must come from the model that is behind this template. And what is the, this model object behind this template? Yeah, I haven't showed you, but let me just set tweets. Yeah, so here you see set tweets actually. Yeah, I want to go here. Here, so user index route, you see? fetches data from the home timeline. So in Twitter parlance, this is the home timeline. So when you go to Twitter and you see your, uh, your, home, uh, your tweets, then it's your home timeline. So it, it fetches this, and then it, it creates a tweet object for each of the tweets. So we have to find, so this author name have, has to be on the tweet object itself. And it, in fact, it's here. So again, this reduces the, the the actual amount of code that you have to write, this little uh, convenience thing that it just delegates. Um, it's like a method missing in some way. OK, and when you click on one of the users, it just displays <coughs> the, that user's timeline. And again, you see that the URL changed. And so another route got entered. 
and and so it's the user timeline that got rendered. So everything else stayed the same. It's just that uh, it's just that the, the, at the last level, the user timeline template rendered its content. It's, and it's totally the same because it's the same tweets and everything. So how much time do I have left? If I can. Okay, I have some more. Okay, so let me show you one more thing like this. So when I started, when I wanted to do something, I wanted to create a simple application to, to gain more Ember knowledge. Uh, and like a Twitter client came to mind, I realized that I really would like a Twitter client to exist to that filters out retweets. I don't know if that resonates with you, but sometimes all my Twitter timeline is just filled with retweets. And when I follow someone, I'm usually interested in that someone and not always and everything else that uh, he or she deems important. So, you see that, uh, switch all this. So I put just a simple checkbox here and did one simple check that works but in the the interesting thing for us is how this is actually done so in the in the actual html all that changed is this one sim one simple thing so from tweets it has become filter tweets. And let me show you. Ah. Okay. So what I want to, to show you is that it's these six lines that I had to add. To, to make this whole thing work. Okay, plus the actual checkbox and setting up that, uh, that binding between the value of the checkbox and the value of this uh, show retweets property on the controller. So by six lines and without any DOM fiddling, uh, this is a functionality that I could add uh, very easily. Okay, so it's, it's on GitHub. You can just uh, fork it, take a look at the code. I'd really like to thank uh, David Toth, who is a fellow developer in Budapest. He actually involved me in, a, in an Ember project, and he actually, or his company actually paid me money for, for uh, learning about Ember. But I already knew some, but um, so I, I learned a lot along this. And this is always just. Um, awesome when you actually get paid for something that you love to do. And also the organizers of camp for, for inviting me and uh, selecting my talk. So if you like to, this is just, I was just scratching the surface. So if you want to learn more, I also set up a, a mailing list. And in fact, in that mailing list, I start with a free uh, screencast series in which I build up an Ember application step by step. So I just add one more functionality and introduce one more concept at, at each stage. So that's it, and thank you very much for your attention.